Welcome to this series of short presentations that describe a practical approach to managing risk. This is the first module of the series that describes some of the fundamental concepts associated with effective risk management, particularly in a modern day setting. Invariably, I find myself flying from where I live in Melbourne to some other destination in Australia as part of my work. In this case, as you can see, I'm flying between Melbourne and Sydney. If I'm not flying within Australia, then often I'm flying overseas to clients. And I'm confident that before we take off, the captain and the flight crew have planned the flight in keeping with their overall purpose, their objectives, which is to convey me and my fellow passengers to our location, our preferred location that is, uh, on time uh, and safely. Uh, and of course, to do that in such a way that the, uh, that the company concerned makes a profit, normally by optimising the uh, burning of fuel on the plane. So before the plane takes off, I would hope that the crew have planned the flight, taking into account the sources of uncertainty which they can anticipate at that moment in time uh, so that they preserve those objectives. But of course, once we take off, they will be faced with a multitude of decisions on the flight between where I am and my destination because situations and circumstances change. They may encounter strong headwinds, there may be changes in the weather patterns, uh, they may be approached by another aircraft that they didn't expect. Uh, and even air traffic control may speed them up or slow them down. And in all these cases, they will have to make decisions of how to act in keeping with that fresh source of uncertainty while still retaining and preserving the overall object objectives of their organisation uh, and the flight. Sometimes, of course, one of those objectives may be sacrificed. They may have to take an entirely different route to arrive at the destination. And indeed, I may arrive late, but I'll always hopefully arrive safely, even if it means that they have to burn a lot more fuel and therefore erode their profit margin. This is the essence of risk management. It's not a static process which we undertake periodically just to generate a report for an audit committee. It is something which is an ingrained part of our decision making every day. We're always considering those things that create uncertainty for ourselves and our objectives as we progress through life. And we have to do that now. We can't wait until the next time. The risk is real now because we have to understand the, that uncertainty and the effect it might have on our overall objectives. And this is the basis of the definition of risk in ISO 31000. That risk is the effect that uncertainty has on what we want to achieve, uh, our objectives or our, our highest level purposes. And it arises from things external or internal to our organisation which create that uncertainty. Uh, we call these risk sources. An, an obvious example of a risk source is what we call in the safety domain a hazard. But risk sources can be threats or even many people believe that opportunities as they present themselves are risk sources. One thing is clear though, given that definition, that risk is neither positive nor uh, negative. It's neither beneficial nor, nor detrimental. It's just risk. And indeed, how we describe risk really reflects on our objectives and the way we perceive the things that might happen to us. I have a client in the far north of Australia whose business is to repair roads and infrastructure. And their view of an approaching storm off the coast is entirely different to a house owner in its path. They have different objectives. One sees the storm as entirely beneficial in that it will boost his revenue for, year, for the year. The other sees it as entirely detrimental in that it could, could disrupt his lifestyle smash up his house and could possibly injure him and his family. The other concept within risk management is that of control. And generally we use the word control as a noun and not a verb. Uh, 
Controls are those things which are already in place, which change risk, they modify risk to that which we find acceptable. And you should note that there are two qualifications here. One is that the controller has to be working now, and secondly, that it has to be modifying risk. If those things in your organization which you believe are controls cannot be associated with risks and are not seen to be changing those risks, then probably they're not controls and invariably they're not needed. If anything, those type of uh, pseudo controls actually limit our ability to progress and they clog up our thinking process to the bargain. I see controls very much as the bumpers which are erected down the side of bowling alleys for children and even their fathers and mothers to help them uh, get a strike or at least get the bowl down to the other end of the alley without it going into the slot. They provide the bounds inside which uh, behaviour is acceptable. In other words, you can think of controls as very much linked to the objectives. They're there to enable us to achieve our objectives. And, and therefore, if we can describe our objectives, we can understand risk, and therefore we can define what are the most appropriate controls to have in place to modify that risk to a level which we find acceptable. There is a complication in that we use the word risk to describe the properties associated with an organisation and its objectives, and we also use the same term, uh, and often the plural version of it, to describe something quite different. Uh, we use the term risks in relation to scenarios or examples of events or things that might just generally happen which could, if they occurred, lead to an effect on our objectives. And the reason we use these hypothetical scenarios or illustrations is to provide worked examples that allow us to discuss risk. In the same way that when you describe to your children what could happen and what therefore it could lead to, uh, to enable them to understand the consequences of their actions, we also use examples of things that might happen that might lead to some effect on our objectives to illustrate and describe risk. We often use events for this illustration, but these risks can be described in terms of situations and circumstances that might arise. One thing is clear though, that these are purely hypotheses uh, and therefore it is not correct to say that a risk has actually happened, what we really mean to say an event has happened, or that a risk has occurred, when in fact we really mean an event or even the consequences that arise from the, from the event have occurred. So you'll see from a conceptual perspective, to talk about risk, we need to understand the sources of uncertainty, the sources of risk that give rise to risk, whether they're external or internal to our organisation. We then need to postulate some example scenarios of things that might happen that could then lead to consequences which have some effect on our objectives. Managing risk is principally concerned with challenging our assumptions, our biases, and indeed our human frailty and weaknesses when making decisions. Particularly, the risk assessment part of managing risk is there to challenge our assumptions and preconceptions before decisions are made. In other words, to challenge our perception about what will actually happen when we take a particular action. Will it actually occur? Will we become successful? And ultimately, will it support the objectives that we've set ourselves? The second element of risk management, of course, is then taking appropriate actions, either the, uh, the actions which require associated with the decision or ancillary actions to make sure that those actions themselves are successful and we still achieve overall our objectives. The third and less obvious but equally important uh, purpose of managing risk is to enable us to identify uh, 
the most important enablers or controls in our business, the, the key controls, so that we can monitor those at all times. Obviously, if those controls fail, then the risk is a lot higher than we're prepared to accept, which really means that we're likely to fail and our objectives are not going to be achieved. So we need to first identify those key controls and then put some sort of system of surveillance in place so that we gain early warning of control failure and we can take preemptive action. Finally, and certainly not least, effective risk management leads to a learning organisation. It drives a deeper understanding of the causes of our successes and failures and how they are linked to the controls that are either in place or required in the future. When you think about decisions which you face, you realise that a series of thoughts go through your head before you take action as a result of that decision. The first thing, of course, is you have to understand what you're trying to achieve through the action, and because there's an action involved, Therefore, how you might go about that. You might need to involve others to at least advise you or be part of that action to ensure that it's successful. Inevitably, you will think about some of the things that will get in your way or could go wrong. And hopefully, you'll also think about those things which are there to enable uh, your success, which will help you achieve the successful outcome and therefore will satisfy your objectives. We try to learn lessons from the past. I can't say we're always very successful from that, but we do. We try and learn lessons from our past and therefore extrapolate the outcomes to the future. And then once uh, you've decided what to do, you have to decide ultimately what that looks like in terms of success and how you might monitor to see if those actions are actually followed through and your objectives are still being satisfied. Those seven thought processes that we mention here are in fact the central elements of the risk management process. This is a diagram of the risk management process, very similar to the diagram in ISO 31000, except with, we've put the diagram on its side here so it fits better on the slide. You can see that uh, we start generally by understanding our stakeholders and involving them in the whole process and we involve them throughout the process. We then start on the sort of the central spine of the process by defining clearly what are our objectives and what is the scope of the decision we need to take. This must include looking at external and internal sources of uncertainty. Also at this stage we structure the rest of the process so that any uh, risk assessment is comprehensive. Then we can move on to actually discover uh, risks. We can identify them through a systematic method in terms of what could happen and what would be the effect in terms of our objectives. We need to understand what that risk in more detail by looking at the range of consequences and likelihoods and the effectiveness of the existing controls and from that we can grow, draw conclusions on whether the current level of risk is acceptable and if not, what further actions are justified. And that leads then to decisions on how practically we might modify the risk so that the level of risk becomes acceptable. The process isn't complete until we move to the bottom bar in the diagram because obviously things change. Our stakeholders might change or their views might change. Those external and internal sources of uncertainty might change. The types of scenarios we use to discover risk might change. Uh, and indeed, our criteria for deciding what's a high, medium and low risk might also change. Particularly, the controls we're relying on to be currently in place and effective to modify risk may change. They may become ineffective, for example. So we need to monitor and review. We need to monitor and review risk sources. We need to monitor and review stakeholders. And of course, we need to monitor and review those key controls. So you will see in this module that 
risk is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, if we are a company that makes profits, then we wouldn't make any money unless we exposed ourselves to risks. And indeed, all organisations are there to expose some form of capital, it may not always be financial capital, to risk to achieve their objectives, to benefit their stakeholders. We've also seen that risk management is, in essence, decision support. While we all make decisions every day, we could make better decisions with a sounder basis if we became more systematic in considering those matters I've just raised. We certainly need to manage risk to prevent losses and problems for our businesses and organisations, but we also need to manage risk to achieve gains and to uh, achieve advantage, particularly after decisions have been made. Stakeholders require us to exercise effective risk management. In fact, it is required by many of the governance standards around the world. And as we've seen, applying a system, a, a process to the elements of the risk management process means that hopefully we'll become more effective and more successful because we would have taken into account all the source of uncertainty, the things that can happen, and had a coherent and comprehensive and current view of risk. ISO 31000, the international standard, provides a very structured framework for managing risk and making sure that it occurs within our organisation. And the rest of this series of modules describes the process and latterly the framework itself and its elements in more detail.